going to be talking about resilience in the workplace today. Uh, just to give you guys a little bit of background about me and where my, my expertise comes in, um, surprise, surprise, I'm an American. Uh, I've got my degree actually in theater. I've got a PhD in theater that I got from the University of California. And I have been teaching in the area of executive development, uh, communication, emotional intelligence, public speaking, collaborative intelligence uh, for about the last nine years or so at the University of California, San Diego. So it is uh, quite a shock to be over here in the UK with uh, the weather that you guys have here. But <laughs> uh, we're going to dive in today to talking about resilience. So let's talk about what we're going to be going over over the course of the webinar today. Uh, first, we're going to start off with just defining resilience. What is it exactly that we're talking about? The second is we're going to talk about how you can tap into your own resilience that you already possess. We're going to be talking about developing some specific resilience strategies to improve your own personal resilience. And then we're going to talk about four specific types of re resilience and how you can develop them if you seem to be lacking in a particular area. And we'll do a little bit of a self-assessment at that point. So if everybody could, uh, as we get started, just be aware that you're going to need a pen and a paper because we are going to be doing a self-assessment that you'll have to write down some personal responses to some questions I'm going to be asking. And then finally, we'll have an opportunity for a question and answer session. I have taken a look at several of the questions that you've sent ahead of, ahead of time and some of the areas that you were looking for improvement. So I'll address some of those, but then we'll also take some of your questions live and I'll be able to answer them at that point. So first of all, I just want to talk a little bit about where uh, the material for today is coming from. There are two books that I'm basing today's webinar on that uh, have really radically different approaches to talking about resilience. They're both really great places to go for further information if you want to dive more in, into more depth into the subject matter. The first is The Resilience Breakthrough by Christian Moore. Uh, this is a book that's much more about your own personal resilience and bouncing back from difficult personal situations that you experience in your life. Uh, Christian Moore is a social worker who spent his life working hands-on with at-risk teenagers, people who are dealing with drug addiction, people who've had massive uh, life changes and uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. So he focuses on resilience from a much more personal perspective and how you develop your own personal resilience strategies. The other book is called Resilience, Why Things Bounce Back by Andrew Zoli. And that is a book that's a little bit more focused on the resilience of systems, of communities, of corporations. So uh, a lot of your uh, interest areas uh, that you sent over ahead of time were in both developing personal resilience and also developing resilience on your teams. So I'm going to be accessing some information in both, from both of these books to address both of those areas. Uh, but if you do want further information, please do take a look at these books. They go into a lot more depth in some of the areas that we're going to talk about today. So the first, uh, let's take a look at a definition of resilience. And this is, again, from the book Resilience, Why Things Bounce Back, that is a little bit more uh, focused on the resilience of ecosystems, the resilience of communities, of cultures, and of organizations. And they define resilience as the capacity of a system, enterprise, or a person to maintain its core purpose and integrity in the face of dramatically changed circumstances. In contrast to that, we can take a look at the definition that Christian Moore has in his book, The Resilience Breakthrough, and I think we can see a change, a difference in the tone between the way the two books approach uh, the, the topic. He defines it as the ability to bounce back after you've every reason to shut down. Resilient people have both tapped and untapped reserves, enabling them to overcome and thrive as they face the setbacks, challenges, and fears of daily life. So his definition of it is a much more internal uh, reflection of how people uh, find a way to recover even when they have every reason to completely shut down, but they still find a way to bounce back and deal with adversity in their lives. So. Continuing on this idea of what is resilience, where does it come from? 
Uh, there have been a lot of previous uh, understandings of resilience that think that it has to do with our personal character, with our belief systems, or our values, or our personality, um, or our experiences in our life. And there have been a lot of studies on resilience in the past few years, and they've actually found that resilience is critically rooted in our habits of mind, habits that we can cultivate and that we can change. So finding and tapping into your own internal resilience is much more about having a shift in the the way that you actually perceive of an event or of a change or of a shift in your life. So the great news about that is we can learn and we can grow and we can increase our ability to be resilient just by understanding that it mostly has to do with our shifting mindset, how we perceive of an incident rather than our ingrained personality or our IQ or our value systems or our belief systems. Those can all come into play, but it's really much more about shifting the way that you think about a problem. So I don't have to do a hands up for this question. It's how many of you have experienced something painful in your life? I think we all understand that everyone has experienced something painful in their life to varying degrees. Some people have experienced something that they perceive as being more painful than others, uh, but all of us have, have experienced something in our lives. But resilience is about how we handle that pain. That's what makes the difference, how we choose to approach recovering from that kind of a situation when something painful sets us back. So some things that, these are just some situations that you might experience uh, that we can think about having a shifting mindset can have an impact on how you deal with each of these scenarios. Uh, some of you may have had a situation where you're dealing with a difficult manager who seems determined to break your spirit. Some of you might have been asked to cut back in your departments and still remain at your current level of productivity. And I spent a number of years as a university professor, so I have seen this one firsthand. Uh, students graduating from university in an increasingly difficult job market. All of these things are issues that I think we can all relate to in some way, shape, or form. They've, they're all issues that we might have been dealing with or that our children are dealing with in their lives or that uh, our colleagues are dealing with. Um, but how we decide to approach each of these situations can dramatically impact our experience of them and our results. I want to start with a very simple formula that I use in a number of the courses that I teach because I think it's a really good formula to think about for approaching our lives in general. S plus R equals E. That stands for the situation plus your response equals your experience. Now in that equation, the one thing that we have control over is our response. We can't control situations as much as we would like to think that we can. There's no way to actually control a situation when something happens, when an event happens. It happens and there's nothing we can do to change it. But how we choose to respond to that situation, to those circumstances, dramatically impacts the way that we experience the whole situation. Just to give an example of, of how this comes into play, uh, I'm from California. And a number of years ago, we had a major earthquake in the city of Northridge, which is just a little bit north of Los Angeles. And as a result, uh, shortly after, for the weeks after the earthquake, it devastated all of our freeway systems in California and the Los Angeles area. And if you've ever been to Los Angeles, you understand how vital our freeway systems are. They're full of traffic to begin with, and then to have several of them shut down, practically closed down the, all of the Los Angeles area for a number of weeks. And so uh, one of the major news organizations went out into the, into the traffic one day as these cars were waiting in an endless line and started interviewing people about their experiences in the traffic jam. And they approached one window and knocked on the window. The man rolled down his window and they said, well, sir, can you tell us a little bit about your experience here? And he says, what are you talking about? It's the, the traffic's been jam-packed for miles. I can't get into work. It takes me four hours to get into work every single day. This was before the days of telecommuting. And he said, how do you think I'm experiencing this? What do you think's happening here? I'm furious. And they said, okay, well, thank you, sir. They walked on to the next car and they tapped on the window and the man rolled down the window and, and they said, sir, can you tell us a little bit about your experience? And he said, oh, well, you know, it is what it is. It's it's going to be bad. So, you know, I brought my thermos of coffee. I've got a little snack. I've got a sandwich. I'm listening to my 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 learning Spanish on tape in my car. And um, you know, I'm just going to embrace learning Spanish while I'm trying to make my way to work. 
Now, both of those people were in the exact same situation, but their experience of that situation was radically different because of the way they chose to respond. There's nothing either of them could have done about that traffic jam, but how they chose to experience that time that was going to be exactly the same for both of them, that, that amount of time, how they chose to approach their response to it radically shifted their experience. And I found that this is a really great formula for any kind of adverse situation that we find ourselves in in our lives. So let's get a little bit more specific about how you can think about reframing and responding in a more mindful way to difficult situations. So there's a four step process that we're gonna go through. The first is you wanna combat denial and actually acknowledge the problem. You're going to ask how you can change this. Uh, we're going to work on developing an objective observer. And then finally, paying attention to how you feel as you shift that mindset. So the first step, combating denial and acknowledging the problem. First, realize the reality of the situation. A lot of times difficult things can happen to us and we don't want to accept that those situations are what they are. That just acknowledging the situation is part of our struggle in coming to terms with what's happening to us. Um, whether it's not being able to make the rent in time or being forced to make a change in your organization that you're resistant to, just realize the reality is the first step in combating that denial. The second step is to understand where is your pain actually coming from. If you're being asked to make a major change in your organization, take an internal look and ask yourself, why am I specifically resistant to this? What's happening that is this triggering something that I've experienced before? Um, where is this specific pain coming from? And sometimes that can help you become a little bit more objective about the situation. And then don't get bogged down by the negativity of acknowledging the situation. Sometimes you can acknowledge it and you can just get overwhelmed by the reality of the situation. So acknowledge it, but still get up and realize that you can do something to change the circumstance or to change your response to the situation. Our second step is to ask yourself how you can change this specifically. First, uh, try to understand how can I use this challenge to better my circumstances. Uh, just to give you a, a real world scenario here, uh, several years ago I was working in a marketing department for an organization that made corporate training films and programs. And we had a massive cutback because we had financiers come in that wanted uh, them to cut, I think, 30% of their overhead. So they, uh, they made redundant a number of positions, including mine. And at the time, I had just committed to a much more expensive flat and a new lifestyle that was com uh, in alignment with my salary that I was earning at the time. So I had to very rapidly rethink what my future was going to be at that point. So I had this conversation with myself. Well, this clearly meant that this was not the path that I was supposed to go down. So what could I have done? How can I rethink what my future is going to be? How can I make something better out of this. The next step is to ask, what can I do immediately? In that scenario, my immediate need was to pay my bills. So I figured out and did some brainstorming of what job can I get immediately in the short term to meet my immediate short term needs. And I went out and I got that taken care of. I got another position. It wasn't exactly what I wanted to do, but it was enough to pay my bills while I did rethink what did I want for my future. And then finally, you ask yourself, what are my options for a plan of action? What are some longer term strategies that I want to take? At this particular instance in my life, uh, I decided that it was time to pursue my PhD that I had been considering for a very long time. So my plan of action was to apply to programs, research programs, and apply to go back to school to shape my career into a new path. Next, we want to think about developing what we call an objective observer. This is a term that I use a lot in emotional intelligence as well. Um, if you're in a really emotionally charged situation, and a lot of times the situations that require us to be resilient are very emotionally charged, take a step back, take a deep breath, don't respond in the moment of, that, of, of hearing that uh, piece of information that causes you to get emotional. Take some deep breaths, do whatever it is that you need to do to try and bring that emotion back down to a more neutral place. 
Be very objective in your analysis of the situation. Something that can be very helpful here is to put yourself in the shoes of the other person who, um, who has perhaps triggered the situation. Um, so if somebody has asked you to do something or asked if, uh, say, a supervisor has asked you to make a radical change for the way that you handle things within your organization, take a step back and put yourself in their shoes and, and ask why might they be asking this of me. And that helps you develop more empathy and therefore be a little bit more objective in your analysis. If that's really difficult for you to do, then enlist the help of somebody that you trust uh, to help you brainstorm or ask questions of the situation. Sometimes having a third party that is a little bit more neutral that can give you some more perspective can be really helpful in helping you reframe the way that you think about the scenario. And finally, you want to pay attention to how you feel as you're going through this process. How does looking at the situation from a fresh or an objective perspective make you feel? How does this change the way that you're seeing the situation? It, how is this impacting you personally? Also, how does your new outlook affect the others around you? Particularly as leaders, we set the emotional tone for the rest of the team. So if something radically, radical happens and a change has been asked of you to make in the organization, other people are going to be looking to you to set the emotional tone. So make sure that you are aware of how your new outlook is impacting the others around you. And finally, can you see this as a strategy for other aspects of your life? Now that you've taken this approach, been more objective about your approach to the situation, how might you be able to apply that to other scenarios that come through? We learn most from doing and from when we feel that we have learned something and we can approach something from a fresh perspective, the more we can think about how to apply that to other aspects of our lives, the more we develop that skill set. So if you found yourself to be particularly resilient in one area of your life, how can you apply that to other areas of your life that you're, where you experience radical change or difficult situations? Okay. So now we're going to talk about four different specific types of resilience and as we do that we're, we're going to start with a self-assessment. So I am going to pop up uh, four different questions and this is where I'd like you to write down your responses to each of them. So for each question I'm going to give you four different possible responses and I want you to select all of those that apply. So we'll take a look here at the first one. Uh, which of the following most applies to you and write down A, B, C, or D and it can be more than one. If more than one of these apply to you then write down say A or and C. Um, so A is I have friends who are there for me even when I have nothing to offer them in return. B, making a mistake just makes me want to try harder the next time. C, when I lack an ability or a skill to complete a task I reach out to ask for help. Or D, I don't need things to make sense before I act. So go ahead and write down how many of those apply to you, A, B, C, or D, and give us a little hands up when you've finished, when you've come to a, a decision about those, and we'll move forward to the next question. Okay, so most of you have responded, so let's move on to question two. And again, select all of these that you think apply to you. A, my circle of friends is increasing. B, I have experienced or am likely to experience some kind of discrimination in my life. C, I am not hesitant to approach people who I perceive to be of a higher status than I am to ask for their opinion or help. Or D, when grow going through a difficult time, I cope by finding something to look forward to. Okay, so most of you have responded to that, uh, so we'll go ahead and move on to the third question. Again, select all that apply to you. So A, I've been told I do a good job of being aware of the needs and concerns of others. B, I've been able to transform some of my limitations into strengths. C, I surround myself with people with different skill sets than my own. And D, it's easy for me to let go of resentment toward those who've harmed me in some way. Okay, so most of you have responded to that. We've just got one more question that we'll move on to. So our last question, uh, which of these apply? I actively seek ways to help those who are less powerful feel needed and influential. B, during a typical day, I tend to focus more on what I've done right than what I've done wrong. 
C, when I'm told no, I seek ways to turn the no into a yes. Or D, after making a mistake, I immediately move on with my life, not dwelling on the error that I've committed. So again, write down all of those that apply to you. If you finished, take a look and tally up if you had mostly A's, mostly B's, mostly C's, or mostly D's. And also take a moment to observe if you were absent uh, any of those. Uh, so if you didn't have any A's, didn't have any B's, didn't have any C's, or didn't have any D's. So let's move on to talking about what all this means. So there are four different types of resilience that we can talk about. The first, if you circled mostly A's, that means that you're strong in what we call relational resilience. If you had a lot of B's, that's something that um, the book, The Resilience Breakthrough, terms street resilience. The third, if you circled mostly C's, is what we call resource resilience. And then finally, D's are what we call rock bottom resilience. And we'll go into each of these areas define what they mean, and also, if you are absent in that particular area, I'll give you some specific strategies that you can start to think about to help increase your resilience in that particular area. So the first one, relational resilience. That is boosting your resilience through human connection, and connecting to others can be incredibly motivational to our own resilience. So if you have other people in your life who you have strong relationships with that hold you accountable or that you feel responsible for, this can be a source of really wonderful resilience for you. So if you know that you've got children or a spouse who depends on you or colleagues who are encouraging to you, who hold you accountable for being successful, our, our strong bonds to those people can help us tap into our own internal areas of resilience. So if you didn't circle very many A's, there are some specific ways that you can think about improving your relational resilience. The first step, surrender the concept of the one-up relationship. We've been taught this throughout, and it's been repeated throughout society, that there are people who are higher and people who are lower. And for obvious reasons, we have that kind of structure set up in a lot of our organizations where one person is higher up on the organizational chart than another. But in order to build our relational resilience, we have to think about doing away with those kinds of labels, trying to create a space where everyone is equal, even if their position within the organization is in a different chain of the hierarchy, we can still surrender that one-up relationship on, on a personal level so that we can relate a little bit more easily to those that are across the spectrum. The second step is to work on engaging more emotionally. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've been on the tube or out in public and I have seen everyone sitting around a table or everyone sitting on the tube with their face inside of their phone and headphones on, completely tuned out to what's going on in the rest of the world. And sometimes even when we're having a conversation with somebody, we're tuned out and we're thinking about that next task that we have to complete or we're thinking about what, that, uh, what we're gonna cook for dinner when we get home or we're thinking about what's gonna happen on our holiday plans over the weekend. Um, try to be in the moment with people when you're engaging with them. Really take time to listen, make time to make eye contact, make time to let them know that you're engaged with them and that will help build your relationships. The third step, turn outward and seek to serve. Um, there's this really wonderful quote from, from the book, The Resilience Breakthrough. He says, selfishness is the destroyer of all relationships. So taking the opportunity, taking the time to, to look outside of yourself and really find out what's going on with other people and seek to try to help them in some way, if you can, is a really wonderful way to build your relationships with people. And that can help you later on if you perhaps need to ask somebody to help you out in a particular situation. The, the idea that you have genuinely taken an interest in their needs, in what's happening with them, and you've been selfless in your understanding of their situation will bring back the same kind of reciprocal response from, from the person that you're trying to build the relationship with. And then finally, drop the facade. Be yourself. Show people who you really are. Don't try to put up too much of a mask because people can sense that. They, they feel like you're not really being yourself in front of them, then they're not very likely to want to build a relationship with you. And that also taps into engaging more emotionally with people, opening up to them. I teach a lot of public speaking courses and I work with executives on getting up in front of people and giving presentations. And that's one of the first most important lessons that I try to teach them is that they're far more engaging if they actually relax and if they act as themselves. 
when they're going into a situation. So that's relational resilience. And again, the, the book, The Resilience Breakthrough, goes into depth with a lot more uh, suggestions for strategies, but these are the ones that I found to be the most, um, I think, the most helpful in, in everyday workplace scenarios. If you selected mostly Bs, uh, that means that you have what the book calls street resilience, and that's drawing strength from your mistakes, drawing strength from people disrespecting you, from experiencing discrimination, and channeling those emotions into a more productive purpose rather than giving in to them. So if you didn't select uh, a lot of street resilience, if you didn't show from that self-assessment that you had a lot of it, here are some ways that you can think about improving. First, make sure that you get the whole picture. Uh, there's another really wonderful quote that says, discrimination comes from only having half of the picture. Take the time to get to know the whole picture. Find out why somebody is has a different perspective of a situation than you do. Get the whole picture and be fully informed before you jump to any conclusions. The second, reframe your limitations as potential strengths. Um, there's a lot of conversation about uh, ADHD in society, and um, I, I've actually seen a play where they talk about uh, the options of medicating children that suffer from ADHD. But actually, ADHD, uh, and in fact, the, the author, Christian Moore, of, of the book talks a little bit about um, giving a child a diagnosis of ADHD is a, should be a wonderful thing for a parent to experience because he says some of the most brilliant and creative people in the world have had ADHD, including Albert Einstein, uh, Pablo Picasso, um, the Wright brothers, Anderson Cooper, Elvis Presley had ADHD. So ADHD can be a diagnosis that can be channeled into something positive. Um, even if you have uh, people who have PTSD, there's possibilities for channeling that trauma into something far more productive in their lives. So take a look at those limitations that you perceive about yourself and re-channel them into potential strengths. If you've experienced any kind of discrimination in your life, how can you tap into to that to be able to turn it around and make it a positive, make it a, a strength rather than a weakness. Next, focus on what you did right today. A lot of times we focus on our mistakes that we've made and we don't give ourselves credit where, when, when we should give ourselves credit. So think about, even write out a list at the end of the day, what are the things that went right today? What were the things that I, that I did really, really well today? In the emotional intelligence course that I teach, we also uh, talk about creating a list of things that you're grateful for. So at the end of every day, if you write down five things that you were grateful for, or five things that happened that were really wonderful or that you did well in that day, that helps actually reshape the way that you think uh, overall. It actually restructures the way that your brain processes information and focuses more on the positive rather than on the negative. And then finally, look fear in the eye. Uh, I deal with this a lot because I teach public speaking and uh, public speaking is actually considered the number two fear in the world, second only to death. And I like to joke that some of my clients would probably prefer to die than get up and speak in front of a room full of people. Uh, in fact, 75% of the population experiences that, that kind of fear. And the only way to overcome your fears is to face them. Uh, the top six fears that people experience are fears of failure, feel fear of embarrassment, fear of death or loss, feel of rejection, feel of loneliness, and fear of pain, either physical or emotional. I think all of our fears that we experience in our day-to-day -day lives are tapped in in some way to one of those six things. So take a look, ask yourself, what am I afraid of? Ask, why am I so afraid of this? And then the only way to overcome that fear is to jump right into the deep end and face it. Um, I've had a number of situations as a theater practitioner where I have been absolutely petrified to put myself out there into the world and, and uh, show the work that I have worked a lifetime to put together. Um, and the only way that I can possibly get through that is to face those fears. So maybe even write down a list of some of the things that you're fearful of in your life and ask yourself, what can I do to try to overcome those fears by jumping directly in and facing them? So the third kind of resilience that we were talking about, if you selected mostly C's, that means that you're strong in what we call resource resilience. 
Resource resilience is tapping into your known and unknown reserves. So what kind of skills, talents, or resources do you possess that you're not currently utilizing? So if you were uh, absent in this area in the self-assessment, here are some specific tasks that you can challenge yourself with to try to improve your resource resilience. The first, cultivate a worthy mindset. If you don't think that you're worthy of accessing a resource or worthy of some kind of positive uh, outcome, then you're not going to be able to ask for it. So decide that you are worth people's time, energy, and resources before approaching them to ask for it. Second, tap into the power of people. Um, now, I do want to say this is not meaning to try to manipulate people into doing things for you. Uh, don't keep score, don't try to have a, uh, a transactional relationship with people, but do, again, if you tap into that relational resource, that relational resilience, then you uh, have a stronger relationship with people and people are far more willing to engage with you and do things for you if you have need of them. Uh, if you have positive relationships with people, then they're willing to go very far for you. And also, think, think about it from their perspective. Um, what's in it for them if they help me out? What, what does that give them? And that might also help you to cultivate a worthy mindset. Take action. It's easy enough to sit down and plan and write out a list of all the things that you could be doing, but unless you take action, all the lists that you can write down are not going to have any power. Uh, I have a, a, a play that I've written that's going to be performing in London and in Edinburgh later this year. And I, right after I wrote the first draft, I had an opportunity to present it at the Young Vic Theatre here in London. And uh, I had a bit of a panic moment. And I thought to myself, I'm not ready. I've just written one draft. I'm, I'm somebody that nobody knows, nobody's ever heard of from America. And I decided, again, facing my fears, to take the plunge, move forward, and submit my application. And right after that, it was accepted, and I was able to have the opportunity to put it in front of a room full of directors that are working here who do have reputations. And that gave me the strength to move forward and to continue to pursue the project. And it wouldn't be in the state of development it is now if I hadn't face that fear, and take an action in the moment that, a, that an opportunity presented itself. Finally, don't accept no. Don't take no for an answer. Um, now, a lot of times, people don't want to say no. That's something that you want to think about, that sometimes people are, are saying no because they've been told to say no, because that's part of their job, or because they don't think they have the resources to give you a yes. So there's a couple of different strategies that you can think about for not taking no for an answer. Um, you want to think about, uh, there's a strategy that I, that, I, that I teach in the emotional intelligence course that I do called Yes And, and that's the foundation of all improvisation. If you've ever seen um, the TV show Whose Line, it is, Whose Line Is It Anyway, or if you've seen any other improvisation programs, that's the basic concept that allows improvisation to work, is to always say yes and then to add to that. So if you get a no, you want to think about, okay, well, why? Let's, let's engage in conversation. Let's figure out what's behind this no and see if we can figure out a way to turn it into a yes. Saying yes makes people feel better. So find out why there's a no and then see if you can figure out a way to turn it around and into a yes. Also, another sign of resilience is being able to hear a no and to be able to walk away and not let it impact you. So sometimes no does have to mean no. But if you can walk away and say, okay, I can rethink my strategy even though I've achieved that no, then that means that you're building your resource resilience. Lastly is what we call rock bottom resilience. And that's ac accessing hope when all hope seems lost. I mean, everybody crashes. Everybody has an all time low in their life. It's part of our human condition. So rock bottom moments can be powerful resilience resources for us. So if you did not have very many Ds in that self-assessment, then here are some ways that you can improve that. The first, again, radically accept your circumstances. Accept the situation for what it is. Second, don't make things worse. Uh, oftentimes we can be tempted to, once something has failed, once we've hit rock bottom with something, to just say, oh, it doesn't matter anymore, and we give in. Um, anybody who's been on a diet, I think, can appreciate that one, where you say to yourself, I'm going to be really good, I'm going to be really good, and then you eat that poorly, and you say, okay, well, I've already eaten poorly, so I may as well order the, the chips um, <laughs> or the ice cream or whatever it is. Um, so don't make things worse. Just acknowledge the circumstances and try to move forward. 
Uh, discover the power of future promise. Um, this can be really large goals that you set for yourself or small ones. If I make it through this day, if I make it through this moment, then I'm going to allow myself to eat the chips at the end of the day or order that glass of wine and really enjoy it. Those can be small term goals or you can think about larger goals that if I make it through this particular transition, I'm going to take my family away on a holiday. Give yourself something to look forward to so that once you've accomplished the task, the seemingly impossible task, you reward yourself in some way. And probably the most important is to forgive. Oftentimes we resist change and we feel, because we feel very personally attacked in some way, um, we feel that emotional connection to something that we feel like somebody's hurt us in some way or the circumstances um, uh, were set, if somebody was set out to, to hurt us. Letting go of that anger and resentment is not only a really positive resilience strategy, it's, studies have actually shown that it's good for our health. If you let go and if you forgive people and if you forgive situations and let go of them, it's been proven to physically reduce your stress, increase your confidence, increase your ability to, um, to empathize with other people. So it has a physical impact on you, the ability to let go of things and to forgive. Okay, so finally I do want to address how do you apply some of these things to your teams. This is where that book, uh, Resilience, Why Things Bounce Back, taps into uh, some areas of strategy for your resilience in your teams. The first is anticipate that change is going to happen. Change is part of life, change is part of organizations. When something's not working within an organization, we have to figure out a way to adapt and to change in order to remain competitive in the market. So just anticipate that change is going to happen and have a game plan in place for how to address change. The second area is cultivating diversity. This is really, really important. Uh, they're having a number of people in your team that think differently than you do can be a really wonderful strength. I teach a course on collaborative intelligence and we talk about understanding what are our blind spots. What are areas and ways that, in, in the ways that people think that I am not skilled in and, and thinking about rather than only hiring people that think the same way that I do, hiring people on the team who actually have a strength where I have a weakness. And oftentimes just acknowledging that you have a weakness is half the battle there because if you uh, do have a weakness, you're not willing to acknowledge it and somebody comes onto your team that thinks from that area of your weakness, then we might feel like we're being challenged in some way. Rather than feeling challenged, embrace that person who looks at the world differently than you do because you will be better able to anticipate and to deal with change when it happens. Building trust is absolutely crucial to your teams. Um, in fact, there's been a number of studies that have been done on the chemical changes that happen in our bodies when we experience uh, trust with people and when we experience uh, adversity with people where we don't trust them. And Believe it or not, building trust releases the chemical oxytocin in our bodies. Um, it's a, a chemical that has a lot of impact on a lot of different areas of our lives, but it's actually something that we release when we, when we feel trusted, when we feel um, uh, welcomed within a, a small group of people, a collective of people. One of the best ways to build trust in a team is to spend time getting to know each other, genuinely engage emotionally, ask people about their lives, ask them about what their experiences are outside of the workplace, find space for that. And people, when they feel like they've been listened to, when they feel like they're understood as a human being, it releases those oxytocin levels and allows them to feel like they've got trust within an organization, within a team. The next is uh, what we call translational leadership. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean uh, the person at the top having all of the answers uh, to get the team through uh, a difficult time. Translational leadership is really about a leader who has access to both the top and the bottom and the, the equal levels of the chain of command. Somebody who has relationships that they can build, who has perspective, that can step back, take a look at a scenario, and be able to figure out who they should put together to solve the problem. Uh, that also involves building networks of people. And then lastly, adaptive governance. That's really taking a look at um, how you can structure your team to be able to adapt quickly to different changes that might be coming into your organization. Again, if you start with anticipating change, then, uh, then you can build your team around the concept of how to adapt to those kinds of ch changes. Okay, 
So now we're going to have some opportunity for a little bit of question and answer. And let me take a look uh, at some of the questions that have come in from people. Uh, let's see. So let me take a look at one here. It says, ah, let's see. Um, the first one is, we are going uh, going under a large organizational change with lots of ambiguity at the moment. What number one tip would you give to someone that lacks skills in resource resilience? So if we take a look again at, uh, going back to resource resilience, let me go back to that slide right there. Sorry. There we go. Resource resilience. Um, okay, so undergoing a large organizational change with ambiguity. Um, I think that one of the best ways that you, and without understanding the, the, the specific scenario, it can be rather difficult, particularly um, in an organization, the, yeah, without knowing the, the specific details, I'm going to give a fairly generic answer <laughs> to this. I would say under that concept of don't accept no under resource resilience, um, not necessarily that, but, but flipping around to the, the concept of getting to know a little bit more about the situation in order to have all, an understanding of all sides of it, um, ask questions. Take the time to sit down with people and talk and try to understand the situation completely. Um, if you work in an organization where communication isn't necessarily flowing from, from one department to the next, um, is there a way that you can have an impact on somebody's decision to be more communicative than that? So find out who is at the heart of some of the major changes that are happening right now and see if you can take the time to sit down and have a conversation with them about what you're sensing from the outside, from your, from your particular perspective, and see if you can engage in a conversation that can be productive to try to get rid of some of that ambiguity. Um, ambiguity can kill organizations. Uh, communication and clear communication is absolutely crucial to getting everybody on board with the kinds of changes that companies need to go through. So um, I would suggest, and without knowing the details, this um, I don't know if this will be appropriate, but to find out who in your organization is in charge of some of the decisions that are being made and request a time to sit down and talk with them about what you're seeing from your end and to get some answers from them on theirs. Uh, let's take a look at another question. Ah, so here's one that says, should we enhance all of these types of resilience at the same time or are they dependent on some factors? This is something that I like to say with all of the courses that I teach. I would say find one area to start with, one particular strategy that you want to embrace. If it's an area that you seem to be lacking in, find one of those strategies that I suggested to start to focus on first. You can't... Uh, and I understand that I'm giving a lot of information in a very short period of time. So, uh, so take a look at what's the one area that you think you can start with today. Don't even make it the most difficult area for you to, to start with. Make it one that you think that you can reasonably accomplish. Um, because oftentimes if we choose the most difficult task in front of us and then we don't, we don't find success in embracing that challenge, uh, then we tend to give up on the rest uh, of the ideas that, that that we can think about embracing. So find one specific area that you want to start with and work on that. And then once you feel like you've got a handle of that, go on to the next piece on your list that you think will be most helpful to you out of all of the, the resources that I've given you today. Okay, how can you not take things personally when someone is saying that you haven't, uh, you haven't supported when you have? How do you stay strong and positive? This is really challenging. Um, but we like to think that emotions don't actually belong in the workplace. Uh, and in fact, with that, let me go forward to our, our slide here with information about the master class coming up in the fall. So those of you that, that these questions don't particularly relate to, you can take a look at this. Um, so how to not take things personally when someone is saying that you haven't supported when you have and how to stay strong and positive. Being objective is a challenge. Um, there is a really wonderful technique um, that's becoming really popular in a number of organizations. In fact, uh, I know Google is embracing this, General Motors is embracing this, and that's um, uh, mindfulness meditation. Just taking a moment to breathe, just taking a moment to concentrate on your breath and be in the moment, just taking a moment to step outside of your emotion of a situation and observe it from a more objective 
uh, what I like to call the objective observer position, to ask yourself questions like, um, why would this person have this perspective? What are some of the things that they might be experiencing that are leading them to have this kind of response to me? And try and really put yourself in that person's shoes and understand the world through their eyes and then sit down and have a conversation with them at that point. Because once you've taken the moment to be empathetic to their situation and see the world through their eyes, then you'll be a lot less emotionally charged when you go into a conversation with that person. Okay, so you've talked about not accepting no. What advice for a situation where, where people show apathy and not a clear no or a yes? Okay, so people who are apathetic are generally not invested in your situation. And that's why they're, they're, there's no real clear yes or no. Um, they aren't deeply invested in your situation quite often is the case. So again, taking the time for a conversation with them is a really fantastic strategy. Get them to see it through their perspective. As I mentioned, um, saying yes actually feels really good. Um, so there are a number of very specific strategies always uh, that are listed in the, um, the Resilience Breakthrough course uh, book. And he says, um, always remember that people feel better inside when they say yes. Uh, you can reevaluate whether or not you need their yes to proceed. Um, use humor whenever possible. That tends to put down people's guards, uh, if, that's, if that's a strategy that you can embrace. And then make sure that your mission and motives are truly in the best interests of others. And that often is what can turn a no into a yes. To, to think about um, how others are going to benefit from, from their response and make that position clear to them that this is going to have an impact on more people than just you. We have time for one more. Okay, uh, this one says, I am lucky to be resilient. Woohoo! Uh, how can I show understanding for those who are not? Yes, this can be, um, this can be a challenge um, because oftentimes we do have people that, that we work with within an organization that don't have the same skill sets that we do. What I like to say is, again, uh, I mentioned that as a leader, you set the tone. We actually have uh, a, a saying for this in emotional intelligence that our emotions are what we call open loop systems. They are um, how we are showing up emotionally, specifically as leaders, because all eyes are on us, is going to have a direct impact on the people that we engage with on a day-to-day -day basis. I would say, again, take that step back. Don't take anything emotionally. Try to put yourself in their shoes. Try to understand where they're coming from. And then take it as an opportunity to be a mentor or be a leader to that person. And ask them questions about and, and maybe guide them in some of these processes that we've talked about today. Um, again, as a leader, you set the tone. So if you get frustrated with somebody who's not demonstrated a lot of resilience, uh, then they're gonna feel that frustration back from you and the rest of the team is gonna feel that frustration back from you. So take the time to, um, to approach it from a coaching or a mentoring situ uh, uh, perspective. Ask them questions, put yourself in their shoes, be understanding, be objective, and then work with them to get them the help that they need to develop the same kind of resilience that you have. Sometimes offering up some perspective, offering up how you would handle a situation, um, would be a really great way to engage in that kind of a conversation. Great.